Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 685 for the 21st of November 2021. Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia with a gang, a group, a team of people who are hanging out after the first day of Skepticon 2021, the New Zealand and Australian uh, National uh, Skeptics National Convention. Joining me in this little virtual have a drink and decompress, we have Susan Gerbeck. Hello, Susan. Hi, everybody. Hi. We have Rob Palmer. Hello there. We have the voice you know so well. It's Michelle Bickersma. Hello, everyone. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, we just don't know why we do that. We have uh, Lyndon. Hello, Lyndon. G'day, everyone. And we have Lara. Hello, Lara. Hello, how are you going? Great. We're all having... Uh, cheers, everybody. Where's my glass? Cheers. Yes. Mm. Cheers. We're all decompressing after day one of the convention. Before we get to chat about day one of the uh, Skepticon, let me tell you what's coming up on this week's show. We're going to kick off with an interview with the ESP, the European Skeptics Podcast, who are celebrating 300 episodes. We're going to announce the Australian Skeptics Awards, the Bent Spoon, the Barry Williams Award for Media, the Fred Thornett coming up. Find out who won the Bent Spoon. Tim Mendham returns with part two of his Book of Tim about Loch Ness. We have the Australian Skeptics News, read by Adrian Hill. And finally, Trove this week looks at acupuncture. But anyway, back to the convention. I hope you all had an interesting and enjoyable day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is great. Mm-hmm. Also enjoyable and interesting. <laughs> and so, anytime you get to hang around with people who have cool accents like Australian and New Zealand, that, you know, <laughs> heck yeah. <laughs> Susie also- Brooks, I mean, my goodness, she was so great. Who was that? Just love her. Susie, oh, Dr. Susie Walsh, absolutely. What a star. What a star. You know, I mean, I didn't realize that she had been part of the conspiracy. I didn't realize that um, Bill Gates and all that, you know, she's got her 5G going and all that. Oh, that was great. I, th- I hadn't heard that story before. I think we're all part of the conspiracy. It was nice to see you in the audience, Michelle. Oh, thank you. I was excited to see Susie Wiles, too. I did know she was um, part of a conspiracy theory, but um, I really enjoyed actually seeing a lot of speakers from New Zealand who, you know, I all, I didn't know. I did know Susie, but not others. So I love that it's combined. Oh, sorry, Richard Wiseman. What a coup. Yes. And yeah. Susie, really. Yeah, they're two, two <laughs> wonderful keynote speakers and uh, behind the scenes, lots of people pedaling very hard, including Lara Benham, of course, pedaling very hard, being one of the moderators. And, uh, we, you know, we, we do thank you very much, together with Lyndon. Thank you, Lara. The, the, the talk, though, I'm, I really, like, I just can't wait to, to see what it involved is the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. <laughs> that's coming somebody, up tomorrow. Somebody <laughs> really involved with that is giving that a talk. Well, well, let me say, that that's coming up tomorrow from our point of view, but the, to the audience, uh, that's today you know this it's all very tricky with podcasts and time zones anyway let's have a little chat at the end of the show but for now it's time for all of us to run downstairs upstairs around the corner i'm going to grab some waffles what are you going to grab michelle oh i'm going to grab a cup of tea to have with cheese and biscuits Mm. and uh, susan what do you think you might have ritz crackers with with mozzarella cheese about you, Rob. Oh, well, we just today bought some uh, New York style bagels. So even though so we're pretty close to New York and New Jersey, that's Ooh. a little hard to get. So I'm definitely going to have one of those. Uh, and sounds good. And Lara, what would you like to uh, what would you like to run downstairs to get? I have ordered a pizza. <laughs> so it's going to run upstairs. Yeah. So it's yes. Well, you never know what's going to pop up. But anyway, for now, let's all enjoy The Skeptic Zone. (laughs) 
And joining me now virtually on the line, as far away as you could possibly get on the planet, it's the European Skeptics Podcast, or it's the real EX, ES, see I can never do it, <laughs> on this I can never do it, <laughs> or, <laughs> <laughs> Are you, this is very familiar I think, I used to be a professional but that's all gone now, or, the real ESP experience. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone ESP. Hey, Sunday, Sam. Hello. Sziasztok. <laughs> I've heard that all before. It's Pontas, it's Annika, and I'm dressed Pinter. Wow. And I am so thrilled and delighted, not only because I can see you all on the screen, which is just fantastic. It's like we're all meeting together, uh, which we've never actually done in person. But I am... That's a shame. That's a shame, but it will happen. But I am uh, just thrilled and delighted to realize that uh, we're coming up for, for you people for 300 episodes. 300? Isn't that mm. unbelievable? <laughs> It, re yeah. it I mean, it, I, even for me to say it, and I'm not involved in, in making your show, but it's a big, it's a big, uh, what we call a, a milestone. It's it's fantastic. And so we'll, we'll start with uh, Andres. What what does this mean to you to reach a number? Is it just another show or do you feel quite uh, happy and proud of 300? Oh yeah, I am. Um, uh, I, I I don't know. It's we we always make up these um, these reasons, these arbitrary reasons to celebrate stuff, right? So uh, it's just in a way, it's just a number. But but that shows that we've been doing this for six years, every week, and that that sounds completely unbelievable to me when I think back. Of the times that we started this and we we followed in the footsteps of of giants like yourself i it's it's no 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 it's it's difficult to comprehend <laughs> how much work uh, is behind us yeah yeah you're absolutely right yeah and and listeners please uh i i don't know how this is going to sound listeners but what Andres just said is, is correct. The work behind it. I mean, podcasts just don't fall out of the sky. You don't just turn on your device and suddenly a podcast well, for the listeners you do. But for us, behind <laughs> the scenes, that represents uh, many, many, many hours of work each week in, in recording and in producing and editing and so on. And Annika, you're, you're part of the, the crew uh, but you're a more recent arrival, shall we say. How long have you been with the show now? Um, I would guess about 70 episodes of the 300, so roughly. I think I think I joined around 230, 240 something. Yeah, somewhere around there. So, yeah, it's it's been a very great and um, good ride <laughs> so far. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready for another 300. <laughs> Ah, uh, don't don't speak too soon. No, I no, I hope I hope I hope you do make it. <laughs> Actually, I hope you do make it. And and Pontus over there in Malmo, Sweden, uh, for you. Do you do you have? To, I guess you don't all have to get up at crazy times because you're all relatively close to each other. Is that right? We're in the same time zone, all three. Same time zone. Cur yes. Currently, that is. <laughs> Unless Andras is traveling, of course, yeah. and that, and that not has somewhere happened. <laughs> but it's, somewhere else. Yeah, well, that's his problem. I think it's we we, we just make him go <laughs> get up very but early it, in the morning. It's, it's good to know that that the, there is someone among us who's who who know where you're at, who, who knows where you're at currently, because you are what time what time is it uh, where you are? Is it five a.m. or yeah, it's five a.m. It's five. It's ten past. Five in the morning, or eleven past five in the morning, where I am at the moment. That's dedication for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, <dedication. laughs> that's right. But but you you three must encounter the same uh, situation I do from time to time when you have an international guest. Either you have to get up at some crazy hour, or they have to get up at some crazy hour or something. We might also encounter that uh, around Christmas in, in January, because I will go over to Australia um, yes. for six weeks. <laughs> yeah, well. It, with with my husband and my my baby. <laughs> well, I, as I said to you uh, in some correspondence a little while ago, uh, if I'm here and, and you know things are a little bit 
um, unsure, but if I'm here, then we'll we'll go out and we can do some interviews. We might even do a live report from the streets of Sydney about something skeptical. <laughs> that would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. And I keep promising Pontas to, to visit him uh, in Malma. I haven't been yeah. there. No, I have, we have a room ready for you here, Richard. So you can come whenever you want to. We've been expecting you for a while now, but uh, <laughs> you, you seem to be busy elsewhere. Well, I mean, I, I'm I'm very pleased to hear that. But where will the dog sleep if I'm sleeping in the dog's house? <laughs> <laughs> No, well, no. you have a standing invitation to Hungary as well. Um, I mean, I I cannot currently provide you with a with a, a, your own room, but uh, I'm more than happy to show you around and uh, give you tours of my hometown, our capital, Budapest. Wow! So uh, yeah, that would be great. Mm. And we have a guest room here too, so <laughs> <laughs> you can do an ESP tour around your. <laughs> I, I I really think I should. Maybe Susan Gerbic and I could do a big tour. Oh, there, yeah, that would be Wouldn't great. That be... <laughs> speaking of Susan Gerbic, speaking of Susan Gerbic, I know that she has been uh, a guest on your show, and I know, and I think that she's some somewhat of a what shall I say a, uh, an influence for you people. Is that right? She's mm -hmm. our uh, skeptical fairy godmother, if you will, if you will. She was the one who introduced Anders and myself to each other, and uh, so she 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 has um, she takes credit, and she she is uh, she deserves credit for doing that. I was just about to say, I think she deserves credit for a lot of things. Mm, yes, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, changing the world word by word. Yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, one hundred and millionth edit too, <laughs> like with her GSRW crew. It's it's amazing. It truly is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wasn't there for the interview last uh, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, it was amazing. By by the time that uh, you guys interviewed her uh, on the occasion of of GSLW reaching a uh, hundred million views, that it was like a hundred hundred million one hundred thousand or something by the time that the interview actually happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it grows. It's growing fast. Mm -hmm. It's ticking over all the time. Now, folks, if you don't listen to the European Skeptics podcast, the real ESP experience, why don't you? You should. And uh, Pontas, <laughs> where can people go online to check out uh, your podcast? We we have a website. It's theesp.eu, EU for Europe, of course. And uh, we have recently actually fixed it up a little bit. So you can search for different episodes. You can search for different people who have, we have interviewed. We've interviewed, I believe, 117 different people. And some of them have been on more than once. So there's a lot of things to find there. Uh, so theesp.eu, that's where you can find us. Excellent. Well, look, folks, I'm thrilled. I really am. 300 episodes for you is just fantastic. And I really encourage you to keep going. Every now and then, you, you might have the same situation. Every now and then, maybe every 50 episodes, I think to myself, I've got to wind this up. That's it. I can't do another 50. And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly I do another 50 and another 100. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we don't know how to stop. <laughs> we don't know what, how to do that, so we'll just go on. That's that's probably my situation. So we still have momentum. <laughs> <laughs> good and, and all power to you. So, my friends, it's so great to see and speak with you all. We don't do it enough. Pontas, uh, Annika, and Andres, congratulations and uh, thank you for being on the Skeptic Zone. Thanks a lot. Thank you for inviting thank us. Thank you. And thanks and keep up the brilliant work. Uh, we still admire whatever you do. Oh, thank you. Whatever I do, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is. Do you yeah, do whatever, it, whatever it is. Whatever it is. <laughs> no, you do a lot of things. You do a lot of things um, uh, uh, apart from doing the podcast. Mm -hmm. so. I understand. <laughs> well, somebody has to feed the cats. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ah, great. I don't know how you can believe Hi, my name is Tim Mendham and I'm the Executive Officer of Australian Skeptics Inc. and the editor of our magazine, The Skeptic. I'm here to announce two of our annual awards for 2021. 
the Fred Thornett Award for the Promotion of Science and Reason, the Barry Williams Award for Skeptical Journalism. Both these awards come with a lovely certificate and a cash prize of $2,000. The Fred Thornett Award, the FRED, is awarded to a member of the public who has made a significant contribution to educating or informing the public regarding issues of science and reason. This year, the FRED goes to Professor Christine McCartney, Executive Director of the National Centre for Immunisation Research Surveillance. She and her crew have spent the last year researching and publishing on vaccines, and Christine in particular has spent a great deal of time communicating about COVID facts and issues to the public, and in consequence has been facing a lot of very nasty messages, as often happens. But well done to Christine. The Barry Williams Award for Skeptical Journalism, or the Wallaby as we like to call it, is awarded for journalistic work that critically analyzes or exposes issues related to pseudoscience or the paranormal. It's not necessarily a pro-skeptic thing, but it has to be critical analysis and proper journalism. This year, the Wallaby goes to Melissa Davey of The Guardian, who herself has faced legal, online and personal threats in her exposure of false ivermectin claims. Nonetheless, she has persevered and produced some brilliant work. Congratulations to both our winners. Hi, I'm Jessica Singer, President of Australian Skeptics, Inc. And I'm here to announce the winner of this year's Ben Spoon Award, given to the most preposterous piece of pseudoscientific and paranormal piffle in 2021. We had an interesting range of nominations this year from a journalist who is chasing UFOs, the Australian Geographic magazine for also chasing UFOs, a naturopath who makes various claims about COVID-19 vaccinations, and even ABC TV for programs about biodynamic agriculture. But there can be only one winner. And this year, the committee has awarded this least sought after prize to politician Craig Kelly for spreading or more accurately shouting, misinformation about COVID-19 and vaccinations. Hello, this is Richard Saunders from the Skeptic Zone podcast and the Australian Skeptics. I'd like to pause to remember three skeptics we lost in 2021, all of whom made valuable contributions to skepticism here in Australia. Michael Wallahan was one of the original reporters on the Skeptic Zone podcast and went on to serve on the New South Wales Committee. He also wrote articles for The Skeptic, the journal from Australian Skeptics. Shelley Stocken was also a reporter on the Skeptic Zone podcast, a soldier in the fight against the anti-vaxxers and a contributor to the Skeptic magazine. We will miss your poetry, Shelley. Martin Hadley served on the New South Wales Committee of Australian Skeptics for over 20 years, reaching the role of president. And when he passed away only a few short weeks ago, he was the treasurer. All three of these people left us far too soon. All three will be missed, but all three left their mark on the sceptical world, and we thank them. Reading from the Book of Tim with Tim Mendham. Hi, my name is Tim Mendham. I'm the editor of the Australian Skeptics Journal, The Skeptic, and Executive Officer of Australian Skeptics Inc. And today we're continuing an article that we started last week on the Nessie Mess, the Loch Ness Monster. And this is from Skeptic Magazine, June 2012, or volume 32, number two. And we spoke before about uh, the participants, especially Colonel Wilson, the surgeon who supposedly took the famous photo of Loch Ness Monster in the 1930s. Now, this is this article that we published in the Skeptic magazine from June 2012 is actually a reprint of an article we earlier published in 1994. 
And now let's get stuck into part two, which is about the hoax revealed. On March 13th of 1994, the London Sunday Telegraph published a story which claimed that Christian Sperling, the last of several men involved in hoaxing the surgeon's photograph, had made a confession to David Martin, a former zoologist with the Loch Ness and Mora scientific project and fellow researcher Alistair Boyd. According to the story and Sperling's confession, the Daily Mail had hired Marmaduke Wetherill, a filmmaker, big game hunter, and Sperling's stepfather to find the monster. Wetherill asked Sperling to make him a monster, which he did, using plastic wood, attached to a 35 centimetre toy tin submarine, bought for a few shillings from Woolworths in the London suburb of Richmond. According to one report from the Sydney Telegraph Mirror in 1994, a detailed study by David Martin has found that Nessie was made in just eight days. The finished monster was 30 centimetres high and about 45 centimetres long, with a lead keel to give extra stability. Marmaduke Wetherill's son Ian took the photo on a quiet day on the lock, according to a Reuters report. A friend recommended Colonel Wilson as a front man, no doubt because of his impeccable scientific credentials and commendable detachment. Admittedly, the reports published in newspapers in 1994 show some slight difference on the number of people involved, with one report quoting five conspirators, Wetherill, his son, his stepson, Colonel Wilson and one other, and another vague uh, several men. The fifth conspirator could be Morris Chambers, an insurance agent who apparently arranged for Wilson to present the photos to the Daily Mail. The Sydney Telegraph Mirror says the photo was sold to an unsuspecting newspaper, whereas the Reuters report implies the newspaper was at least indirectly involved in the hoax. On this latter point, according to monster researcher Nicholas Witchell, In 1933, the Daily Mail had hired a famous big game hunter, Mr. W.A. Weatherall, spelling is different, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and Royal Zoological Society to track down Nessie. After only four days, Weatherall's team came across footprints on the south shore of the loch. Plaster casts were made and sent off to the British Museum of Natural History, which earlier the next year reported that they were unable to find any significant difference between these impressions and those made by a hippopotamus. The footprints, it turned out, were made using a Loch Ness residence hippo foot umbrella stand, which probably explains why all the footprints were of the same foot. <laughs> On January 15, Weatherall reported seeing something while cruising the loch, but he said he was convinced the lock only contained a large grey seal. The following year, he resigned his fellowship of the Royal Geographical Society. No more was heard of him until the recent report. It has been suggested that Wetherill's involvement in the surgeon's photograph was an act of revenge for the debunking of his hippo monster prints. Witchell makes no suspect or otherwise connection between the Daily Mail's sponsoring of Wetherill its apparently innocent publishing of his 1933 claims, and the same paper's later publication of the surgeon's photograph. Witchell also, along with almost everyone else, apparently failed to notice what Ronald Binns, author of The Loch Ness Mystery Solved, finds extremely significant, which is the date on which the photo was taken. When was that? April of 1934, says Tim Dinsdale. Early in one morning in April 34 adds F.W. Holiday in The Great Orm of Loch Ness. Early April, agrees Witchell. April 34, says Costello in Search of the Lake Monsters. Although clearly identified in Gould's Loch Ness Monster and others, the date was not mentioned again until 40 years later in Professor Mackle's The Monsters of Loch Ness. And the date? April 1st, 1934. April Fool's Day joke or not, apparently the perpetrators of the hoax were overwhelmed by the huge fuss their trick aroused and were afraid to confess, a reaction that's often shared by many another hoaxer. Nonetheless, their photo remained in active circulation for another 60 years, becoming the most famous photograph on the subject and reprinted almost without fail with every subsequent book or report. 
The history of the surgeon's photo is a classic cautionary tale for all involved in the search for proof of the paranormal, be it unknown animals, UFOs, psychic powers, or whatever, and a particular warning for the use of photographic evidence. Proponents of the surgeon's photo stress the supposed photographer's impeccable scientific credentials and demeanour. Their attitude amounts to nothing less than ironic, naive and probably hypocritical snobbery, especially when one considers Witchell's comments about the evasive ingenuity of the scientific community. Either they're detached or they're evasive, but they can't be both. They also stress that the photo had not been tampered with, indicating that they are in dire need of a little application of Occam's razor, but they seem to too rapidly overrule the possibility that it could be a real photo of a fake monster. Dinsdale, in particular, was clearly prone to wishful thinking, claiming to see a knob on the top of the creature's head. Such a detail is extremely indistinct in the photo, if not totally non-existent. It seems that these marks, the knob, and the extra set of ripples behind the monster are either part of a subtle fake or genuinely part of the monster, he said. The answer is, they are neither, for it is not a photo of a genuine monster and it isn't even a very subtle fake. The subtle aspects are in his mind. The ripples circling out from the monster seem inordinately big, even for such a large and bulky creature as Nessie is often described to be. This in fact, is the view of current legitimate investigators of the Locke's natural history, who claimed after the hoax's exposure that for the last 10 years no one had given credence to the photo for this very reason. The author of this article, which is me, by the way, made this same point at an illustrated talk on unknown animals given at Sydney University in the mid-1980s. But what seems obvious to some people is obviously invisible to others, particularly those with a predisposition to believe. In the current age of computer-enhanced, computer-manipulated and more importantly computer-generated images, photographic evidence becomes entirely shaky. An original photograph can be scanned into a computer, enhanced to an almost infinite degree, and a new, apparently untouched negative produced. An even greater manipulation is now possible with totally digital technology. You just need to look at the concept of deep fakes, of video of people who don't exist. Of course, there are still eyewitness reports to be dealt with, but these by their nature are intangible and prone to innocent and ingenuous enhancement of their own, as every friend of a fisherman will tell you. In a way, it is sad to lose that icon of the age. The surgeon's photo truly was a classic not of the real Loch Ness Monster, as it turns out, but what we would like to think exists there. What it does represent quite clearly is how our wishes can run away with us, leading us to see what is not there and to characterise our wishes as reality. In the future, as much as in the past, we would be advised to apply some common sense and commendable detachment before heading for the deep end of the loch. And that's the second part of the Nessie Mess, written by Tim Mendham, which appears in the June 2012 issue of The Skeptic, volume 32, number 2. And as we said, you can download this article from the Skeptic's website, skeptics.com.au. In fact, you can download the whole issue for free, like you can with many other issues in the magazine. But while you're there, stop downloading for free and subscribe to The Skeptic magazine. It'll give you the information you need on the Loch Ness Monster and everything else. Allora ciao, io mi chiamo Professore Dave, io ti voglio insegnare tutte le cose sulla scienza. Parliamo di fisica, di chimica, biologia, astronomia, matematica e tante altre cose. Guardami su YouTube, arrivederci! Hey everyone, this is Professor Dave. I want to teach you about all kinds of things regarding science. I want to tell you about physics. I want to tell you about chemistry, biology, astronomy, math, and many, many more things. Come check me out on YouTube. The channel is called Professor Dave Explains. Take it easy. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave Explains.
Hello, this is Adrian Hill from Canada, land of waffles, maple syrup, and the occasional shifty moose, here to read the Australian Skeptics Newsletter, number 136. This newsletter, in full, is sent out every other week, complete with links in all the stories. You can subscribe to this newsletter at www.skeptics.com.au. Hi all, it says. Just a few days to Skepticon. One of the benefits of an online event is that you can make a booking right up to the last minute. But that last minute is approaching rapidly, so if you want to see the event live, then you should book soon. You can do so for the low price of 40 Australian dollars at the Skepticon shop. And that's about 36 Canadian dollars for those Canadians listening. And in the meantime, if there is a meantime, the judging panels are poring over the nominations for the various annual awards, the bent spoon being particularly anticipated. These will be announced on Sunday morning at the convention, as will the New Zealand awards, seeing as Skepticon is a joint venture this year. The speakers at the convention are drawn from Australia and New Zealand, as well as the UK, Russia, USA, and Sudan. An eclectic mix is guaranteed for all, you can see the full list on the speakers and program pages. Read on. Tim Mendham. Okay, Tim, we shall do just that. News. Detox routines to undo the COVID vaccine. Medical experts are speaking out against COVID-19 vaccine so-called detoxes that some inaccurately claim can remove the effects of vaccination received under mandates and other public health rulings. In one TikTok video that has received hundreds of thousands of views, unfortunately, Carrie Madej, an osteopath based in Georgia, USA, claimed a bath containing baking soda, Epsom salts, and the cleaning agent Borax will, quote, detox the vax, end quote, from anyone who has received a jab. We presume you're not supposed to drink it. Yuri Geller's so-called psychic powers helped Boris Johnson gain power. Not the puff piece this sounds like. Rather, this is a takedown of another entirely credulous article extolling the wonders of Geller's significant and highly overrated so-called psychic powers. The main reason not to believe in astrology. What, apart from the fact it doesn't work? This article looks at why we trust generic descriptions of ourselves. While it's from a few months ago, it's obviously still relevant. Astrology hasn't changed much over the years. It handily points out astrology's astronomical errors, in all senses, and accurately describes the Barnum effect. Science and pseudoscience of food allergy and intolerance testing. Adverse reactions to food are common and estimated to affect around 20% of people in Western countries. And while potentially life-threatening, they're increasingly being so-called diagnosed using unorthodox, scientifically unsound methods. Mexico's National Homeopathic Hospital. Yeah, I don't think I'll go there. An interesting story on a 130-year-old institution, the only such hospital in Latin America, thank goodness. And not only the hospital, but the National School of Medicine and Homeopathy, part of the government-funded National Polytechnic Institute and the Directorate of Traditional Medicine, again government-funded and developing COVID prevention and care strategies using herbalism, acupuncture, and, of course, homeopathy. Needless to say, the author of this piece is not impressed. Events. While some skeptics groups are running their regular skeptics in the pub get-togethers online, the same talks but bring your own beer, an increasing number are returning to the live face-to-face -face format. Check your local guides to see when and where such activities are on or if they are on, considering any COVID restrictions. Check with your local skeptics for more information. Skeptics in Action if you have any ideas for stories or want to contribute to Skeptics Communications, such as the magazine or Facebook page, or just have something you want to get off your chest, then you're welcome to get in touch. News leads should be sent to newstips at skeptics.com.au. Submissions for the magazine, etc. should go to editor at skeptics.com.au. 
And of course, comments and suggestions, even those rude ones, should also go to editor at skeptics.com.au. Items of interest. The Psychic Mary Tarot deck walks on the grass. A cannabis-oriented reimagining of the famous Rider weight cards is not your typical tarot set and not your typical designs. In fact, they look rather dull. Maybe they figure the user will add their own illustrations in their minds. <laughs> oh, and my favorite, silliest story of the week. Psychics fall out over a feud and lizards. Inside the bitter feud between two psychics and former friends after one claimed the other was, quote, an alien-like reptilian lizard, end quote, in a bizarre online rant. The other says, quote, I didn't see this coming, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> Guess he should have. All right, that's all for now. It's time for me to run upstairs to make a coffee to wash down the waffles and to enjoy the beautiful but cold Calgary day. And who knows, maybe even to spot a moose. This has been Adrian Hill. See you next time. Hello, this is Maynard. Did you know that you can listen to The Skeptic Zone on YouTube? Yes, I know, sounds crazy, but it's true. Also, you can hear 40 Logical Fallacies with Michelle Bickersma and Funny Sketches with Richard Saunders and a host of other skeptics. Just click on the YouTube links on the homepage at skepticzone.tv. Once again, to dive into those archives at Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia, full to the brim, and even then more, of uh, digital archives, newspapers, gazettes, periodicals, magazine, diaries, journals, broadsheets, tabloids, menus, napkins, back of envelope, calculations, who knows what else. Who knows what else? Diaries? I think I said diaries. Anyway, all searchable and all at your fingertips. And we've had a great time over the last year or so looking at references in Australian history to all sorts of paranormal bits and pieces. And today we're going to continue with a look at acupuncture. acupuncture been mentioned in the digitized Trove archive. Yes, it has. But before we start, I thought I would take a quick side trip to Skeptoid website because I know Brian Dunning produced a episode, an episode of Skeptoid about acupuncture. And this dates from 2014. And for your information, this is episode 431 of Skeptoid. And it says, briefly, to remind you, because I know, undoubtedly, you listen to that fine podcast. This Chinese medical tradition stretches back over 3,000 years. The wisdom of ancients providing medically valid results even today. Well, that's the tease, isn't it? And then it says, or is it? Let's cast a skeptical eye at one of the most popular alternative medical modalities in the modern world. And it goes on to say, Exactly how ancient is acupuncture? Not nearly as ancient as you may think. The first clue is right there in the hands of the acupuncturist. Those slender, flexible stainless steel needles, the technology to make them didn't exist until about 400 years ago. And Brian Dunning goes on here to talk more about research into acupuncture. And there are several points to remember one is that there's no plausibility behind the basic concept. That is, putting little needles into your skin will effect, channel, somehow, energy. What energy? Qi energy. Which, as far as we can possibly determine, was simply made up, as were the meridian points and the channels of energy in the body, which 
there is no evidence that they actually exist. So they were probably made up, concocted sometime in the past. That coupled with poor results when uh, tested against placebo and sham acupuncture, that is putting needles any old where, and reports are patients still feel a benefit, or pretending to put needles into the skin in another trial. And again, patients report a benefit which does seem to heavily indicate the placebo effect. But we should dive now into the archives at Trove and see what references, what stories, reports have been published here in Australia about acupuncture. Now let's start in the year 1973 on the 15th of February from the Canberra Times. Acupuncture fails. Geneva, Sunday, Australian Associated Press. A Western anaesthetist says after three weeks of observing acupuncture in China that he is convinced the practice of killing pain by puncturing the body with thin needles fails more often than it succeeds. Associated Press report. Professor Marcel Gemperel, director of the Institute for Anesthesiology at Geneva University, said acupuncture should not be practiced in the West as long as there was, quote, no detailed honest data supporting claims that it is a complete success, end quote. Not off to a flying start. And we move forward a year to the year 1974 on the 29th of November, again from the Canberra Times. Acupuncture criticised. Tel Aviv, Thursday, Australian Associated Press, Reuter. Acupuncture was catching on in the United States at an ominous and potentially harmful rate, according to an American doctor who thinks it is sort of tribal medicine ineffective in the West. Dr. William Kroger, executive director of the Institute for Comprehensive Medicine in Beverly Hills, California, said in Tel Aviv, there was no scientific rationale for acupuncture, which, quote, is nothing more than psychotherapy, end quote. And again in the year 1974, from, and here's a good one, the Banana Coast Opinion, Coffs Harbour, and that is in the state of New South Wales, 14th of February, 1974. Future for acupuncture. There was a definite future for acupuncture in country towns, a Sydney advocate of the 5,000-year-old Chinese medicine said today. And I'll just comment here right off the bat that uh, that opening paragraph says a lot um, because it states that uh, acupuncture is 5,000 years old, and I don't think there's any evidence for that. And not only that, it's a 5,000-year-old Chinese medicine, which again... There's no good evidence for that either, in so much that it is a medicine. Douglas Whitland, age 32, has extended his consultations on acupuncture to Coffs Harbour one day a week. He has a diploma from the Hong Kong College of Acupuncture and is also an osteopath. Mr. Whitland, and I'm pleased here to say, just as an aside, that they don't call him doctor, Mr. Whitland, a Canadian said he thought there was a more ready acceptance of acupuncture in Australia than in North America. When you explain the logic behind acupuncture to an Australian, he is more likely to say he'll give it a go. He said, Problems discussed by Mr. Whitland during his first day in Coffs Harbour on Monday included a liver complaint, rheumatic problems, and a shoulder complaint. He will be at the Elite Motel each Monday for a consultation. He said acupuncture was not a magic wand and people should not expect immediate cure in most cases. There will be an easing of symptoms and a steady improvement, he said. Acupuncture corrects imbalances in the energy flowing through the body by influencing the energy flow at points where the hair-thin needles are inserted. The person may feel a slight sensation of heat or numbness and occasionally a slight prick. However, this is less unpleasant than having an injection. Mr. Whitland said some people he spoke to were openly sceptical, but their scepticism did not affect the capacity to treat them. He came into contact with acupuncture in Southeast Asia several years ago and was impressed with the Eastern people's complete faith in it. 
I suppose I was initially skeptical, but it appeared then to be based soundly on a time-proven therapy, and I have found this to be the case. He said, I found I had to take time off from my studies of acupuncture to get in tune with the completely different philosophy of life of which it is an integral part. Mr. Whitland's wife, Loris, an Australian he met overseas and followed back here, is now studying acupuncture in Sydney. He said acupuncture could be applied to all illnesses except where the sufferer was beyond human help or where immediate surgery was necessary. That's an interesting article. Is he implying then that acupuncture could be used for viruses and so on? One wonders? Cancer, maybe? I don't know. 1974, that was a long time ago. But let's move on to the Papua New Guinea Post Courier, dated uh, the 27th of July, 1973. Tropical doctor asks, What's the point? Visitors to China who are interested in medicine are likely to be offered the privilege of observing a major operation under acupuncture anesthesia. The patient seemed to be quite alert, although usually having received, quote, pre-medication, end quote, drugs like those used in Western surgery, lies quietly on the operating table. And now I'll just stop there to say, I think that's a big clue in that last paragraph. We read on. One or more fine needles are gently inserted into a distant part of the body and quietly stimulated by twisting or by electricity. After some time, the patient is regarded as ready for the operation and his abdomen or chest or skull is opened for the procedure, the patient conversing quietly with his attendants throughout or sipping tea. The anesthesiologist, using acupuncture, can travel with just a few needles in his pocket. Expensive machines, highly purified gases and dangerous drugs, the essentials for our modern anesthesia, are not required. How suitable would acupuncture be for Papua New Guinea? There are many lessons for Papua New Guinea in Chinese medicine, and it is inevitable that contact with China will increase. But perhaps we should sound a few warnings before planning that all our anaesthetics be given by this elementary economic method. First, even in China, acupuncture does not always work. Conventional anaesthetics have often to be used to assist acupuncture when the patient feels pain. Some patients seem better candidates for acupuncture than others. Second, the theory upon which acupuncture is based as yet no basis in Western science. Acupuncture seeks, quote, meridian points, end quote, where stimulation or irritation will influence disease or pain in a distant part of the body. Our sciences of anatomy and physiology cannot locate or explain these points. This does not mean they do not exist, but it justifies a proper scientific skepticism. Third, the success of acupuncture should be seen against the success of China. We learn of the great enthusiasm in China for the national cause, the loyalty and devotion to the leader, philosopher Mao Zedong, and great solidarity of purpose of the Chinese people. We know that the enthusiasm with which any treatment is promoted greatly affects the patient's response to it. If we are not able to reproduce at least some of the elements of Chinese enthusiasm and ideology, we might expect we would not be able to reproduce their excellent results with acupuncture. And accompanying this story is a illustration of a Chinese gentleman with uh, meridian lines uh, down his side and along his leg. The caption says, Chinese acupuncture points on the body. Each acupuncture point on the body has its own importance within the 2,000-year-old Chinese science, or art, of acupuncture. And I'm just uh, reminded of one of the logical fallacies Michelle Bigasma mentioned in her segment last year, uh, the appeal to tradition, or the appeal to ancient wisdom.
And finally, still stuck in the 1970s, again from the Papua New Guinea Post Courier, and this is on the 7th of May, 1976. How about acupuncture for cows? The ancient Chinese practice of acupuncture has become a topic of increasing interest in medical circles around the world in recent years. So far, most of the discussions are centered on its healing effects as a source of relief or even, possibly, cure for many human ailments. Now it is being applied in the animal kingdom in the Republic of China and shows promise in meeting a major problem of the livestock industry. Three staff veterinarians of the National Taiwan University are using acupuncture to treat cows, which for one reason or another are sterile and do not bear calves. Their research program, it is believed, could open a new vista for acupuncture practice in animal husbandry. The program was conducted by Feng Heng Peng of the National Taiwan University Veterinarian Hospital and two others. Nine cows, including six with cystic ovaries and three which fail to come in heat, the period when conception is almost certain, were chosen for the experiment. They had previously been treated unsuccessfully by other methods. With the help of instruments, the researchers decided on two acupuncture points near the ovaries on both sides of the cow's spinal columns. An acupuncture point is where the experts say needles deliver the maximum stimulus effects. The veterinarians called the points Yong Chi Hishush, and I apologize if I've uh, pronounced that incorrectly. Each cow was punctured one to four times at the points with electrified needles. Oh, poor cows. Two cows were released from the experiment for non medical reasons. They probably ran away. All those remaining are now pregnant. Two of the cows, which had failed to come into heat for over one year, showed signs of the approaching period within 19 days after the first treatment. The remaining five, all suffering from ovarian cysts, had received hormone injections two or three times without favorable results. The ovarian cysts of four of the cows disappeared following the first acupuncture treatments. The first sign of the approaching fertile period were found around the tenth day after the treatment. Because of the shortage of open grazing land, says Feng, most of Taiwan's milk cows are raised on small farms and given hay and concentrated feed. This has contributed to the comparatively high number of cows on the island suffering from ovarian cysts. Such cows have long been treated with hormone injections, but the cure rate has been no higher than 70%. And according to Feng, the hormone treatment also has the disadvantage of forming anti-hormones, so that different kinds of hormones must be used in subsequent shots. The acupuncture experiments with cows so far indicate over 90% effectiveness. But the researchers are cautious about making far-out predictions. They point out that the scale of the first experiment was small and that the program is not yet completed. One thing appears to be certain. Acupuncture can be effective in restoring the heat cycle of cows and perhaps other animals as well. How does acupuncture cure? That is a frequently asked question, but still without an exact answer. Many theories to explain it have been offered. None is scientifically verified. The ancients said the needles regulate the flow of qi, the invisible life force, and correct any imbalance affecting the vital organs. Chiang Chun, an associate professor of physics of the Academia Sinica, believes that both static electricity and electric polarity work in acupuncture anesthesia, pain relief, and cures. Feng Hang Peng favors the theory that acupuncture stimulates inactive organs and corrects organic imbalances. When an organ or part of an organ is inactive or functions abnormally, he says, the body is sick. Acupuncture stimulates the nerves and aids in 
sick organs to function normally. And the picture accompanying this is very hard to see because it's a black and white reproduction of low quality, but it appears to be Feng Heng Peng and another vet treating a cow. So there you go, a little look into just some of the references to acupuncture in the journals and gazettes of Australia. And indeed, in this case, Papua New Guinea. Once again, we thank those good people at the National Library of Australia who take the time and effort to digitize these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pages and have them searchable for us to enjoy. trove.nla.gov.au You'll never know what you'll find. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. I'm still here with the crew decompressing after day one of Skepticon. And uh, from our point of view recording, we're all going to go to bed very soon so we can all get up very early and prepare for day two of the convention, including, uh, which people have already heard in the show, of course, the winning of the Bent Spoon Award and the other awards. I'm excited for the big reveal. I've heard your teasers on the radio shows in Melbourne and I think elsewhere too. And I am excited that you're actually going to reveal the findings of the Psychic Prediction Project. Yeah, because a lot of you people have been involved over well over a year in in, uh, working on that project, for which I am very grateful indeed. And I'm also grateful for those wonderful people out there who sponsor the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal, and you can do that at skepticzone.tv. It's those wonderful people who do that means the rest of you can enjoy the show. Well, my friends, what a treat it is to hang out with you after day one, and uh, we're all looking forward to day two. But for now, but for now, this is Richard Saunders and the whole crew here signing off, and cheers. 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 (laughs) You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. It's all right, Susan Gerbeck. Folks, the, these sorry. are the pe- sorry. These are the people who stay after the music to listen for the dice game. Yes, we've got the dice game back. It's a D eight. D eight. D eight. Well, let me see. You better That's double check. That was a five. You guys have messed with me in the past. You all right. Roll number one. Five. What do I hear? What What do I hear, Michelle? What do you think? Well. Isn't D8 like a date? Like G8 <laughs> is great when you speak the, um, in text. So I am actually going to go with the 8. 8? I have the opportunity. You don't always get that. Susan's going to pick 2. Uh, Rob, what? No, 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 five, no, no, no. 5. 5 for Susan. Uh, everybody listening knows you're not. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> Rob. Um, it's got to be 5. It's got to be 5. Five. Five. I know. My standard four. Four, and I think Larry, you were saying two before. You were... I'm going to go with two. All right, here it comes. Hmm. Six. Oh. <laughs> Everyone's disappointed. That's terrible. Okay, next roll. Are you going to stay with the same numbers? Yeah, but I want to be able to see it because you know. Uh, trust me. Yes. Here it comes. Next roll. Uh huh. Eight. Yay, eight. eight. 
Eight. Y'all got it. And no the, matter which way you hold it up. That's right. And the last oh, one coming up. Left, here it comes. Four. Eight. Oh, eight. Wow. <laughs> Ooh, two out of three. That's two the second three. time that's happened to you, to Michelle. I think you've got some special magical powers, maybe from your friend. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thanks, Eric, everyone. I, come on, you guys. Look. <laughs> All, all of you people listening, you know how hard I am trying to make sure that it, some, it just doesn't feel right. You know, I like once in a while a five will come through just to tease me and just kind of be there. And I think today's the day. It's going to be fine. One, five, five. Uh, one no, day. One no. day.